Good evening and welcome to the final Briz Science for 2018 and hence a little bit more festivities uh, from your MC. I'm your MC, Joel Gilmore. Uh, tonight, of course, Briz Science is presented by the University of Queensland and this is our free public lecture series on science it's presented once a month here at the fantastic The Edge, part of the State Library of Queensland. I'd of course like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. I'd also like to advise everybody who has a mobile phone to switch it to silent and to open up Twitter. Because good, good timing, good timing there. This is, this is what we're, 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 we're on the ball tonight. Um, because, of course, tonight, after our speaker presents, we will be taking questions. Now, you would have received some question slips on the way in, so you can write your question down on that, or you can tweet them to us at BrizScience, hashtag BrizScience, and we will get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the night. Finally, after the talk, we do have some fantastic food and drink outside. We'd love you to join us for that ask lots more questions of our speaker, anything we don't get through up here, and generally engage with your fellow science-enthused um, audience member. Just want to remind you that the food doesn't technically start till after the talk is over. <laughs> and if you could leave your Tupperware containers in your bag until after the sort of the, the general um, eating has commenced, that would be great. You know, not, not that we would ever, you know, uh, try and put water on your enthusiasm, but just keep that in mind. Fantastic. Um, so I think on that note, that is all of our housekeeping. So it is my great pleasure tonight to welcome Professor Phil Hugenholtz from the University of Queensland. And at Briz Science, we always encourage people to look deep inside themselves in a search for truth. Tonight, we're taking that a little more literally and we are going to be talking about the microbiome, all of the organisms that live inside our body and which we now understand to be incredibly important. And who better to present to us tonight? Um, Dr, uh, Prof I should say, Professor Phil Hugenholtz what, did his PhD at the University of Queensland back in 1994 before going off to dazzle the world and he came back in 2010 to start a new centre, the Australian Centre for Ecogenomics which now has a team of more than 50 researchers and support staff. So here tonight to tell us more about the microbiome and what it means, please join me in welcoming Professor Phil Hugenholtz. Um, thanks, Joel, for that wonderful introduction, and thanks to Briz Science for the invitation, and thanks to everybody for turning up and braving the active shooter on Coronation Drive and being here tonight. I was thinking maybe 10 people would be here after that, but that's great to see everybody here. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to tell you tonight a little bit about the uh, mighty microbiome and uh, why we might think it's mighty. And actually, it's going to be a little bit of a history lesson as well. And I will start by, first of all, um, may, uh, declaring a business interest. So I'm a co-founder of a company that uses some of the technology uh, that will be described, that I'll describe tonight, uh, that's looking specifically at your gut microbiome. So we should start with the definition of the microbiome and what it is. Uh, there are actually a couple of definitions out there, and the one that um, I subscribe to is the one that was put forward by Whips, Lewis and Cook in 1988, and it's a nice uh, definition. Uh, it's uh, defined as a characteristic microbial community that occupies a reasonably well-defined habitat, um, and it refers not only to the microorganisms, but, and my favourite line, it encompasses their theatre of activity. Um, so the theatre of activity. So the theatre of activity can actually be defined at, a, at any number of scales. So a theatre of activity could be a termite's gut, and we've actually spent a fair amount of time looking in the guts of termites, and to be frank, they're actually much more interesting than humans. Um, and you can define uh, a theatre of activity at the global scale as well. So I think um, when people hear the term microbiome, what they actually hear and think about is themselves. And that's probably why most of you are here tonight. So um, when we hear about the human microbiome, that's really all of the microorganisms that live in and on us. 
And most of that is actually occupying the lower gut. That's the, you know, the vast majority of microorganisms that we cohabit with are in our lower gut. Uh, and so, um, it's fair to say there's been quite a massive change in perception about microorganisms. So it wasn't long ago where ev when, every, when anybody ever thought about a microorganism, they'd be thinking about something bad, a pathogen. And in fact, it wasn't uncommon to see uh, ads back in the, in the 60s and 70s where they'd have taglines like, the only good bug uh, is a dead bug. And there's been a real... Um, big change in our perception. So now, microorganisms are thought of as our friends by and large, and that's the term microbiome was coined and people have latched onto that. And there's an increasing recognition that they're actually an essential part of us, and they've been termed our second genome or our second organ uh, that helps us to survive. So I could have put up any number of covers from any number of uh, journal magazines. I just picked this one from Nature. Uh, talking about our other genome, and uh, the microbiome, you know, has been, the gut microbiome has been known for a while to aid us in digestion, fibre digestion, and maybe producing some vitamins that we can't do, make ourselves, but it's become more and more evident uh, in recent years that it does a lot more than that. It, it uh, interacts directly with our major systems, our immune system, our neuroendocrine system, and our, as well as our digestive system. And when you think about it, um, this is not particularly surprising because we've been co-evolving with these organisms for a long time. I mean, it's quite a trick if you're a microorganism to be able to coexist with our immune system, for example. So that would suggest that it's more than just things passing through, it's organisms that have really been with us for a long period of time and are very important for our um, very existence. So if you have something like that in your um, body that's so important, then it's not surprising if something goes wrong with it, um, you're going to see changes in that that could be uh, an effect of a change or could actually be cause a change. And so now there's just dozens and dozens of studies coming out and showing that the microbiome is involved in many, many physical and mental disorders. And so that raises the exciting possibility that if you can adjust that, you may be able to rectify some of those disorders. Um, there's a huge increase in the primary research, in fact, pretty much impossible to stay up with. This year, we're seeing about 500 papers per month uh, on the microbiome, the human microbiome. So I think it's fair to say that with something that's become so popular and heating up, it, falls, it, can, it can fall into this hype cycle. So I actually saw this um, slide uh, last week at a, a conference on the gut microbiome from uh, Elizabeth Bick, and she was just pointing out um, these aspects. So there's a lot of um, uh, talk about the microbiome, and there's a lot of information out there, there's a lot of... Uh, peer-reviewed research, but there's also a lot of stuff on the internet and a lot of, you know, stuff that's a little bit um, maybe not as rigorous. And so that's because, whoops, that's because there's a um, uh, sort of huge um, peak of inflated expectations about what the microbiome may be able to do for us. And then you get this um, realization and go down to a trough of disillusionment. But the important thing is that you get this slope of enlightenment and finally you get to this productivity. And so that's where we're heading. Now, I'm not exactly sure where we are on this curve. Uh, some people would say we're here. Other people are definitely pointing out in no uncertain terms that they think it's been all overheated and, and hyped and that they're heading straight for the trough of disillusionment. But what I wanted to spend some time on tonight was actually to look at the technology trigger. Because if you understand what is the technology that has brought us to this point that we're so fired up about the microbiome, um, that will give you a better perspective about how to look at what we know critically. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to step back in history a little bit to address this technology trigger. So I'm going to step back uh, 300 years. So the first observation of um, bacteria was by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, who's um, broadly termed the father of microbiology, but in fact was not a scientist. He was a businessman, and he went through a number of different businesses at the time that he uh, started to look at microorganisms was uh, when he was a draper. And so he got interested in lens making as a way of looking at the, the fabric in the cloth more closely up, more close up. 
And so he discovered that if you took a glass filament and you stretched it out and you pushed the end of it, you could make these beautifully formed filaments, uh, lenses rather um, easily. And the, the state of the art in lens technology at that point was grinding lenses. So he'd found this way of making these very small and very effective lenses which allowed him to see the microbial realms uh, at much greater detail than anybody had seen before. And he kept that a secret because he was worried that people would, once they knew how to do it, they wouldn't be listening to him anymore. So he actually held on to that for a long time. But he published, uh, he sent letters to the Royal Society about all his observations. So a lot of different things are credited to him. One of them is that he was the first to see bacteria. And what he did was he, um, so that's where he put it, it was a single lens system. Whoops, uh, I'm gonna push the right button. Um, so he put his lens here, it was just five centimeters long, and he took a scraping of his own mouth, and he looked at it under the microscope, and that's when the first bacteria were seen. And he wasn't a bad artist, actually, so these were some of the different types of cells that he saw, bacterial cells. They're not a particularly exciting mob compared to all of the morphology you find in larger organisms, but you saw basically um, a spherish, a coccus shaped organisms and rods, which are, and then some filaments. And he indicated here that you could see them moving. And, uh, and one of the things that he said was that these are, these are unicellular organisms capable of their own life, and that was actually received with a fair bit of skepticism initially because people weren't thinking that you could have single cells that could be autonomous entities. I thought <coughs> it would be, have been interesting if he'd taken a fecal sample and looked at that, he would have um, be, been the first to see the gut microbiome. And indeed he did take, he'd been a very direct Dutchman, he did take a fecal sample and he did look at that. And he, uh, and he saw bacteria there too and some giardia, so he probably wasn't too healthy in that respect. Um, so then a couple of hundred years later, uh, another major event in microbiology occurred when uh, Robert Koch in 1881 developed this nutrient uh, gelatin so that he could grow microorganisms, take them out of the microscopic realm and bring them up into our realm. So this was a major um, uh, development. But in fact, it was, it was not him that um, came up with the media that we use today. It was a, um, uh, a lab assistant in his lab that had the uh, critical insight. So he created this nutrient gelatin which would not be solid um, beyond 25 degrees Celsius, and so it wasn't particularly useful. And what uh, Fanny Hess did was that she recognized that um, agar, the properties of agar, which is where the modern agar plate came from, which allowed you to have this solid growth medium uh, at much higher temperatures, and that was really the, the breakthrough. And why am I pointing out solid media in particular? The reason is because it allowed for the first time that you could isolate individual colonies of bacteria, so that's a single bacterium that's been um, diluted on a, been streaked out on a plate, which then multiplies and you have a clonal uh, colony of that organism. So it was the first time you could get microorganisms in pure culture and that was a big breakthrough. Now, if you combine those two pieces of information, if you um, look under the microscope and you count the number of cells that you see and you take uh, the same sample and you plate it out and you do a quantitative colony count, um, there's a very marked uh, discrepancy between the counts. And this has been termed the great plate count anomaly. So typically, you see in the order of 100 to 1,000 or even higher factors of cells under the microscope then grow into colonies on the plate, um, which immediately raises the question about, well, what are all those cells that are not growing into colonies? Are they representing different organisms that we haven't seen before, or are they just you know, organisms that uh, we've already got in pure culture, but we uh, just don't grow for whatever reason. So t the answer to this observation um, really uh, uh, started to take shape in the 1960s uh, when Emil Zuckerkant and Linus Pauling, uh, the famous chemist, um, wrote a little article uh, in the Journal of Theoretical Biology in 1965. So the structure of DNA had been determined at that point as the hereditary material, and they posited in this paper that, you know, if we want to understand how organisms are related to each other, we should be using um, DNA and proteins um, rather than morphology, which is the basis of most of the comparative uh, studies which allowed you to see how organisms are related to each other. And this man, Carl Woese, had read that paper, and during the 1970s, um, he started his plan for how he could actually take that uh, 
um, that idea and turn it into reality. And so what he um, thought was that he could take the um, ribosome, which is the protein manufacturing uh, mechanism in our cells, which is very conserved across all cellular life, and if you looked at the um, DNA, or RNA in this case, because it's a functional RNA that's comprising in the, that's in the ribosome, then he, that would be the kind of uh, molecules that you could compare to each other, work out how organisms are related to each other. And that's exactly what he did. After a couple of false tries, he ended up going with this um, particular subunit of RNA. It's comprised of a number of different subunits called 16S RNA. I'm sure um, quite a few people would have heard of it in the audience, and we'll see why in a minute. And so this is a secondary structure, so it folds up into a secondary structure, and that's part of what's in your ribosome, which makes your proteins. Um, he did this, at, uh, he was quite ostracized pretty heavily during the 70s. They thought he was a bit of a nutter to do this, and people at his institution were telling uh, students not to go to his lab because he was a crackpot. But he actually had the last laugh, although he bore the scars of that ostrac uh, being ostracized for many, many years. And um, he... What he did was he basically turned our understanding of microbiology on its head. So if you consider morphology as your primary way of working out how organisms are related to each other, you get this beautiful figure here uh, where you see all of these organisms and you're working out how they're related to each other based on Darwin's original idea that we come from a common descent. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense. We can see that, you know, we're related to other primates, and they've even got dinosaurs on this picture. But if you look to see uh, where are the microorganisms, where are the bacteria, they're all clustered down here at the root of the tree. And why wouldn't you put them there? They're unicellular, they must be primitive. They must be um, really at the base of the tree and, you know, at the very start, starting of life. But when you looked at the 16S uh, RNA sequences and you compared them to each other, uh, and then you produced a tree, it was completely different. And so what happened was that all of the large things here get compressed into just one tip of this tree. The rest of this tree is microbial. So all of that diversity we had been overlooking because it's so simple, uh, morphologically. And actually what Carl Woese is um, best known for, although I always ask the students every year and very few people put their hands up to know who Carl Woese is, which would have made him angry, I'm sure, um, is that he discovered a major new lineage of life other than bacteria, which he originally called archaea bacteria, but is now called archaea. And uh, these organisms are actually more closely related to us. And there, also note there's a lot of um, microscopic eukarya as well. And when you think about this for a, just a couple of minutes, it makes perfect sense. After all, all the macroscopic organisms have only really turned up in the last half a billion years, and life's been around for, you know, more than three billion years. So life was, for the most of its history, was microbial. So this makes perfect sense. So Norm Pace was a colleague. Norman Pace was a colleague of Carl Woese, and he was aware of the 16S RNA, and he was a big proponent and advocate of that. And he was keen to try and use that molecule to identify organisms. He was interested in um, unusual organisms, thermophiles, organisms that have unusual properties. And he was looking at <coughs> a spring at, in Yellowstone National Park called the Octopus Spring. And he was particularly interested in the outflow channels, which you can see here. And in that outflow channel, there's these very conspicuous um, pink microbial filaments. So he knew they were microorganisms, but there are millions of, of these cells wrapped around each other so that you can actually see them by eye. And he had a student try to grow these, grow these up, because his goal was to extract the 16S RNA in order to see how they were related to other organisms. And so he had a poor student work on this for several months. Um, the student tried uh, liquid growth media, they tried agar plates, and nothing was working. And the story goes that one day, Norm was getting very frustrated by this, I'm sure not as frustrated as the student, and, um, and he said, God damn it, you know, I can actually swore much worse than that. Um, he swears much more than that, he's still alive, I'm afraid. Oh, that's, I didn't mean, that's not what I meant. Um, he's very much alive and he's a great guy. Um, so uh, he, he said, you could take these um, pink microbial filaments, I could pick them up with my hand if it wasn't boiling, and I could just chuck the whole lot into a bucket of phenol and extract 
the nucleic acids and get the 16S without having to grow it. And that actually was the, the, the penny drop then that you can bypass the need to have to grow these organisms on an agar plate or in liquid culture and just extract the DNA directly from the environmental sample. And this was the beginning of the um, culture independent approach in the 1980s. Now, uh, I was fortunate to be able to go and work with Norm Pace, who, as I said before, is a great guy. And, um, and he, he uh, gave me a really um, nice job to go and use this technique to get these 16S sequences directly from uh, Obsidian Pool, which was another hot spring in Yellow, um, Yellowstone National Park. And this one, <coughs> this one um, was full of uh, um, different organisms in the sediment. Now, you might be wondering what we're doing there. Um, oops, I keep pushing the wrong button, that doesn't help. Um, so, uh, we, what we've got here, Sue Barnes and myself, is that we had put some slides into the, uh, into the spring for a week so that organisms could colonize them so we could also look at them microscopically. Unfortunately, the sediment's very roiling around it, buried it about one foot under the sediment, so we had to really yank it out to get it out. So, um, and uh, this was the re result of a couple of years' work in Norm Pace's lab. And so this is another tree, and the way you read it is that this is showing the primary lines of descent in the bacterial uh, domain. And uh, if it's blue, that means that's a primary line of descent that's got some cultured organisms that have been grown on an agar plate. And if it's red, that means it's just sequences that had been pulled out for the first time out of that environment. So all the groups that had OP were, that had their first representative pulled out of obsidian pool. And I remember being blown away by this figure because each one of these segments, this is based on the 16S RNA as I mentioned, um, has more uh, diversity than the plants and the animals combined um, based on that gene. So all of this diversity we hadn't been seeing. So that was the answer to the great plate count anomaly. All of those organisms that you can see under the microscope you couldn't grow on a plate represent some highly novel lineages. So there have been hundreds of habitats that have had this, uh, been surveyed using the 16S profiling method. And so just examples of so the hot springs we mentioned already, deep sea hydrothermal vents. Uh, so the microorganisms down here, despite the um, the, uh, uh, the exotic location are actually not that far away from E. coli, for instance. So um, from an evolutionary sense, a little bit pedestrian. Uh, you get organisms, microorganisms that live inside rocks, um, uh, endoliths, and uh, you get uh, lots of microorganisms associating with uh, plants and their roots and on their surfaces. So there have been a lot of surveys there. Um, this is an interesting one, an acid mine drainage uh, ecosystem. So this is where you get basically sulfuric acid and you get microorganisms that can live and thrive in, in sulfuric acid. Um, humans, which we'll talk a bit more about in a minute. Um, this is what's growing on your shower head uh, at home. And so there's a bunch of microorganisms that thrive in your shower head and you're dosing yourself up with them every time you have a shower, which is probably good for your immune system. Um, this is sampling of the air in a uh, New York subway, uh, which turns out to be mainly um, related to your foot microbiome. So that's the majority of the organisms floating around the air coming from feet. And then uh, a lot of studies of the ocean, all different types of parts of the ocean, heaps and heaps of studies. So we have a lot of 16S data on a lot of different samples. So this is another way of looking at the data. So on this axis is the year, so starting in 2000 to 2012. And then on this axis is what is called cumulative phylogenetic diversity. All that means, it's not the number of 16S sequences, it's when you put a new sequence onto a tree, how novel is it? Is it something that we've seen before or is it something very new? So the more, the more novel it is, um, the higher it makes this axis go. So back in 2000, if you looked at 16S sequences that were obtained from isolates, organisms that we could grow on a plate, versus these organisms that were being pulled out of these 16S surveys, about 85% of the diversity was from isolates. And then you had a transition, a flipping point, around 2005, and then as of 2012, it had completely reversed. So 15% of the diversity, evolutionary diversity, we can grow on a plate. 85% of it, we haven't been able to grow. So I just want you to keep that in mind as we go forward. So 
16S has been a, a great uh, molecule, a famous molecule for um, start getting the ball rolling, but it does have a number of limitations. First of all, you have to have a ribosome. So if you're a virus, you don't, you don't uh, have a ribosome because you use your host's ribosome to make protein. So we don't see viruses, for instance, with 16S. Um, obviously, limited functional insight. So we know it's got a ribosome, so it can make protein, but that's all we know. So what about all the other functions that are encoded in that organism? We're only seeing this one marker gene. And finally, the property that made the 16S so useful in the first instance which is that it was very conserved so that you could compare organisms across huge evolutionary distances. It also limits your ability to resolve down at the closer um, end of the spe spectrum species. So, for instance, um, we would have a lot of trouble distinguishing us from other primates based on this, uh, on this gene. So you get this resolution at about the genus level, typically amongst bacteria, and this is a, a picture from a paper on the gut microbiome, and you'd often, you'll often see these type of um, data there where they have different genera of bacteria and how much you're seeing them against some variable. But it's important to realize that um, these represent um, multiple different groups that are not resolved by 16S. So the solution to that then is rather than just look at that one marker, look at the whole genome. So this is a representation of the E. coli genome, a common representation of microbial genomes because they're, they're um, usually circular bacterial genomes, uh, as opposed to us where we have linear genomes in chromosomes. And so this is a common representation of it. And if you look in at, if you zoom in, so this is um, 4.6 million bases, this particular E. coli. And the 16S represents one gene in that genome and typically represents only 0.1% of the genome. So we've got 99.9% .9 of the genome we could be looking at in order to work out what the organism is doing. And of course, that's really important if the organism hasn't been grown on a plate because that's the only way we can learn about it. So what really started the field of genomics was this fellow here. He's probably better known than Carl Woese, Craig Venter. Um, and he's standing in front of a map uh, of the first bacterial genome sequence. So you can see it's circular here. It's Haemophilus, so it's a bit smaller than E. coli. That's why it was the first one sequenced. So just shy of two million bases, and it's from an isolate. And so his insight, his contribution, was that the way the sequencing technology works um, is it comes out in small fragments, so what they call reads, sequencing reads. So it's essentially like a jigsaw puzzle. And so his contr major contribution on this was that he um, came up with shotgun sequencing, where you get all of these reads from the organism, and then you put it back together like a jigsaw puzzle. And a few years later, he applied, in principle, the same techniques for sequencing the human genome. And that's what he's better known for. But this is what he started with, Haemophilus. So, essentially, if you take an isolate, and you apply shotgun sequencing to it, sequence the DNA in a shotgun fashion, and put it back together, that's genomics. So conceptually, it's not a very big leap um, to find out what you do with the norm-pace approach of things where you get the sample from the environment. So you just, instead of sequencing an isolate, uh, you sequence um, a community of organisms, and that actually, by the way, is the picture of the slide that we were attempting to pull out of Obsidian Spring. So there are lots of different organisms growing on that slide. And so if you take that community and you sequence it, then you have something that has come to be known as metagenomics. <clears throat> it's got a few different names, but that's the one that's stuck. So if you ever hear the term metagenomics, that's what it's referring to. So metagenomics is like genomics, except that it's like putting together instead of one jigsaw puzzle, multiple jigsaw puzzles. And you don't have the, um, the lids either, so you don't know, typically you don't have the lids. And, um, and what's more, it's missing pieces. So you don't have all, you don't have all the pieces, so um, what you end up getting at the end is you might get some of the jigsaw puzzles back in um, uh, almost complete, and you can tell what they're doing, and then others will be partial, and you may be able to tell what they are from those partial ones. And this is basically this completeness of the component jigsaw puzzles within the, the metagenome is um, basically a function of the amount of sequence data. Uh, 
So you sequence more, you get more jigsaw pieces, and you can get more jigsaws put back together in a very simple uh, way of framing it. So this is just to give you an idea. Now, now we're actually returning back to the original thing, which is the what was the key technology trigger. So the key technology trigger is actually um, one of the main ones is, the, is this high throughput sequencing. So this just gives you an idea of the scale of what's been going on. So this was actually the, um, the first metagenomic study of an acid mine drainage biofilm, which I showed you the picture of before, because it's a very simple community. It was selected for that. And the, Depart the US Department of Energy um, pay, uh, sequenced about 76 million base pairs of data using an older sequencing technology called Sanger, which is one of the original ones. Uh, and that cost about a half a million dollars. No, was it? Uh, it was a lot of money. I think it was half a million. Um, and then a few, that was 2004, that was the first metagenomic study. And then five years later, um, these new sequencing technologies hit the ground. And there are a number of them, but the uh, prominent one, the, the leader, technology leader, is a company called Illumina. And the Illumina machines in those days, it was a huge um, revolution in how much sequence data they could produce. So a uh, cow rumen was the, was the um, uh, beneficiary of this analysis. And suddenly, they could produce 17,000 uh, million bases instead of 76 million bases, so 17 gigabases of data. Then just one year later, uh, there was a, a human gut study from a consortium between the Europeans and the Chinese. And they sequenced um, 570 gigabases of data in 2010. And that was just seen as, I remember when everybody saw the paper, and went, holy hell, how much data have they sequenced? But this is where we are today. So um, ANOVASEQ, which is the latest incarnation of the, the Illumina technology, in one run can sequence three terabases of data. Uh, and to give you an idea, so the throughput's just, it's a lot, a huge improvement. Um, but also the cost has gone down. So that first investment from the US Department of Energy, if you sequence it on a modern machine, it would cost less than a dollar today. It's very, very cheap. So you can generate a lot more jigsaw puzzle pieces this way. And this has really been just in the last few years. And the, the sequencing sector is extremely um, busy at the moment. So this may be viewed like this in just a few years. There's, there's competing technologies out there uh, where they can make larger pieces rather than small jigsaw pieces. They can make quite large pieces. And the throughput keeps going and going. So I expect that this is not the end of the story. But for metagenomics, the ability to pull out these genomes is just going, is just improving and improving and improving. So just, uh, just to drive that, I won't belabor the point too much. So in the 2000s, when it started, you get back millions of reads. And so generally, there's just not enough reads, not enough jigsaw pieces to put back together the jigsaw puzzle. So techniques were developed where just looking at the unassembled jigsaw puzzle, you tried to work out something about the community you were looking at, and that's called gene-centric analysis. But now, when you're generating gigabases, billions of bases, or even terabases of data, you can take those reads, you can assemble them together, and you can reconstruct them into their component genomes. And these are called metagenome assembled genomes, or MAGs for short. That's the uh, phrase that's stuck. And with, when you have that, then you can tell, you've got the blueprints for all of the component organisms. You can see not only who's there, but you can see what they are capable of, what they're potentially capable of. And so just to go park back the difference between the metagenomics and 16S, I pulled out this slide from the company. And so this is, I think, not a bad visual way of understanding what's going on. When you use the metagenomics, you get this very high resolution picture of the uh, component organisms. And if you use 16S, that is pretty blurry, but you get a, um, a blurrier picture of what's going on. You can tell there are things there, but you just don't have the same resolution. So a little bit like the, the difference in ground-based telescopes versus um, space-based telescopes, and you just get that higher resolution. So you get species-level resolution. You, tech, you can detect organisms that don't have ribosomes as well because you're not using a marker gene. And of course, you've got the blueprints, so you can see uh, what the function is. So. With the new sequencing technology, we applied it to a um, pilot study of uh, the gut 
um, metagenome of 250 individuals, um, and keeping in mind that this type of study um, just wasn't possible even five years ago because it had just been prohibitively expensive. So just, to, just I, sh I forgot to mention that in that original acid mine drainage study, it was one sample. All of that energy went into one sample. So this is <coughs> 250 individuals. They self-sampled with fecal swabs um, to get a little bit of poo, and then the DNA was extracted from that, and then it went through that uh, sequencing and reassembled these mags, or metagenome assembled genomes, and from those 250 individuals, there were 1,881 <coughs> mags, and uh, that's on average, you know, eight genomes that were recovered from each uh, individual on that study. And if you then look at that, um, compare them, to, they represent 334 species. So we can look at those 334 species on this type of plot. So each dot represents a different species. And the, uh, the axis is here is that's its relative abundance. So you can work out the relative abundance of a mag by simply looking at the number of reads from an individual sample that map or match to that m reference mag, to the genome, and that gives you an idea of what is its relative abundance in that person. So you can see that <coughs> these generally range from 0 to 2%, um, and this is the prevalence. So out of the 250 individuals, how many individuals did we see that particular species in? And really, the, the main thing I'd like you to see from this figure is the number of blue dots, or turquoise blots, dots. So they are uncultured organisms. They're organisms that have not been grown on an agar plate, about which we don't know anything up until we can get their genomes back. The red ones are named, which means that they, in all likelihood, have an isolated representative that's been characterized in pure culture. This is another way of looking at the data. So here we have um, the, each column represents a different individual in the study. So these were the Australian individuals here, or some of them, not all 250. And then each row represents a different species, remembering that this is at the species level because that's what the metagenomics buys you. So it's not a group of species, it's not a genus, it's a species. And so <coughs> uh, the data was compared to some other metagenomic data sets from Europeans, and also um, some tribe has the tribes uh, people from uh, Africa, and then as outgroups, mouse and guinea pigs and pigs, and I have to um, admit that I didn't realize that we're actually more closely related to rodents than pigs, so that was a bit of a uh, surprise to me. Um, and so what you can see is that, first of all, that every individual has a different gut microbiome, uh, so this, the colors indicate the relative abundance, so more abundant species are in red and less abundant uh, down to white, and so you see every individual's got their own sort of unique gut microbiome, but we can tell they're all human because we have so many hits as opposed to, say, uh, the rodents, and none of these uh, particular species are found in pigs, but a few of them are found in some rodents. So that just shows you that's a, that's a function of how long ago we had a common ancestor, right? So I'll just introduce you to quickly to a couple of the uncultured ones, just to give you an idea where we're at. And so this is uh, genus CAG65, um, and it's in the family Lachnospraceae. So in the 16S literature, um, when we've been describing uh, the gut microbiome, you'd often read about the family Lachnospraceae. That was actually a common unit to display the data at. So this is a genus, and actually a species of a genus, and it's in, uh, ultimately in the firmicutes, which is one of the dominant uh, phyla that you find in the gut. And it has an average relative abundance across that cohort of a quarter of a percent, and it was found in three quarters of the individuals. Um, and from that, we managed to recover uh, 37 mags, so we have a good sort of sampling of that organism across the, uh, the, um, the data, uh, across the cohort. So, Looking at the blueprints and inferring the metabolism, we could see that it's a sugar fermenter. Um, it can produce butyrate, which is an important short-chain fatty acid in, in the gut for gut health. Um, it can move. It's got flagella, so it can move, and it can sense, so it's chemotactic. And it also has an enzyme called the sialidase. And these last three uh, are indicative that this organism is likely associated with the epithelial lining. 
Now, this is another genus, CAG37, um, that's in the same family. So, in a 16S study, you'd, these would typically be lumped together. So, this one has um, similar average abundance. It's in 90% of the cohort in this instance, and we have quite a few draft genomes to work from. And its metabolism is quite different. It's a sugar and starch fermenter. It produces lactate. It can break down quite a number of complex uh, compounds, including citrate, chitin, and urea. And it can fix its own carbon dioxide. So even though it's in the same family, it's got quite a distinct uh, metabolism. So it tells us it's metabolically versatile. Uh, and, and my point being here, that oh, I should tell you that Lactinospiraceae comprises about a hundred different genera, and each of those genera comprise maybe up to a dozen species. So we're talking a thousand different species that we've been up till now lumping together. So our, you can see the, the um, analogy in terms of the resolution. So when will we have, knowing this, when will we have a complete picture of the human gut microbiome? So this is uh, our study here. So on this axis is the number of samples, so 250 individuals, and then 334 species recovered. The, the meta-hit study of the gut, which was that European-Chinese collaboration, <coughs> um, estimates that there are up to um, you know, around 1,000 different species that might be um, in, the, in the human gut, and they sampled, um, uh, that's how many you'd have to sample. And then there was a study by Norm Pace, who we mentioned before, with um, uh, Dan Frank, that estimated across the whole uh, human species, we may have up to 40,000 distinct species present in the gut. Now, um, <clears throat> one thing to be aware of here is that uh, if you're thinking at this end of, of the spectrum, you're really thinking about transient organisms that aren't part of our core gut community. So to get an idea of what are, is the core gut microbiome, a lot of uh, microbial ecologists spend a lot of time thinking about core microbial communities or core microbiomes. If Remember I mentioned the reed mapping, um, where you can take all of the reeds that you got from a particular sample and then map them back against this set of th only 334 species. And in the Australian cohort, 60% of the reeds mapped. So more than 50% of the reeds are mapping to that set of species, um, which may be... Is, is not surprising given that those species were um, derived from that cohort. But if you do it against the European cohort, it's not much left. It's 55% it's of the reeds. And if you take the Hazda tribesmen, who have a very different diet and culturally different, it still describes almost half of the diversity. So what we're looking at, I think, is uh, a, f a, a smaller set of species which are more common across the human species. So now onto the question of the cultivation then. So um, there's been a couple of optimistic papers published back in 2016 that make claims that say, yeah, the majority of bacteria in the human gut <coughs> have been cultured already. We have them in culture. But if you look at the 334 genomes that we recovered, um, only 30% of them had cultivated representatives. So 70% of those organisms did not do not have or at the time, did not have cultured, cultured representatives. So I think that is the key take-home message of any of the messages tonight, that you know we're getting these organisms, their genomes back, we can articulate them very accurately at the species level, but the majority of them we have not seen before, and we have not, um, we're just now starting to learn about. And that's why there's been th this huge frenzy of research activity, because we're... Um, you know, looking at all this new diversity that we can now articulate in a much better fashion, and, and we're at the beginning stages of that. So in terms of the hype curve, I think that's something very important to keep in mind. But what I would also say is that I think in the next five years, the human gut will be the most studied habitat on the planet in terms of metagenomics. Um, lots of, uh, there's lots of research now. People are getting in addition to getting their own genome sequenced, there are now many offerings to sequence your gut microbiome. And so I think we will see now, currently worldwide, we may have 15,000 gut profiles out of a uh, population of 7 billion. So I think we can expect to see that number rise quite rapidly. And I think we will start to have a really good handle on what all those organisms are doing. OK, and that's where I will stop tonight. Thanks for your attention. Uh, and I'm happy to take 
questions? Actually, I think I'm contractually blind. Thank you very much. We'll give you a chance to have a quick drink if you'd like. Meanwhile, we will collect questions. So if you have some questions for Phil, write them down on your question sheet, wave those questions in the air, and Leonie and Dominico will come round and collect those as we go. Obviously, uh, there's no talk next month because it's the end of the year and we're taking a little bit of time off. Um, so we will be back in the new year though. We've had a fantastic year at Bridge Science, or I have, and I hope you all have too. Thank you so much for your support. We've learned about food and astrophysics and beers. Um, so what more could you want out of life? Um, but do, if you're not already signed up to our mailing list or follow us on Twitter or Facebook and so forth, please do so and we'll be able to keep you informed when the next event starts. All right, I'll, I'm gonna jump to Twitter first. We, we'll probably kick off with some questions here. So, let me see. All right, Phil, I would like to join you, get you to join me back on stage. Your first question is, what do you think about probiotics? <laughs> <laughs> that was the other talk that I would have given if I hadn't given the history of, that yeah, would have been part of the talk. So the probiotics that are currently available commercially um, represent just a very few number of uh, species and they're again informed by our, this great cultivation bias. So they're things that we've been able to grow. So whether they're the best organisms to be, I, I think the concept is fine, adding organisms, although in, in some circumstances you wouldn't want to put probiotics onto a gut that was in a decimated fashion or something. And there's been a study recently that shows that you're going to stop me if I just start rambling, right? No, no, okay. you keep going. Um, so the st study No one has to be anywhere tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there was a recent study that suggested that um, people that have basically lost their gut microbiome, if they take probiotics, it can actually impede the recovery of the normal microbiota. Mm. And so um, I think that we can do a lot better with probiotics. If we have all the blueprints, we can find out species that are associated with good health. Now, that's not meaning that they are causal, but they're certainly associated. So they would be good candidates for um, uh, pro human probiotics uh, that could assist. So I think there's a lot of ground to be made there, and the current set are a very small minority of all the potential ones that could be obtained. And I guess everybody knows about fecal microbiome transplants, so maybe that... Yeah, there's a couple of questions about oh, okay, that so we'll so, you can, so feel free to follow on. That was going to be my next question to follow up with, so... Yeah, so fecal microbiome transplants, I, I think I don't need to explain how it works. But, oh, I um, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, just go to YouTube and have a look. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you can see... You can don't see do that one at work, yeah. everybody. So that has been shown to be effective um, with uh, Clostridium uh, difficile infections. Uh, and the main concern there is that we're not quite sure what's going in. Um, so you, your donor may have viruses or other organisms that haven't been characterised. So you could actually use metagenomics to get a very high resolution picture of what is in the donor stool. There have been some studies to show that it's very much uh, individualised process between the donor and the recipient. So some populations can engraft, what they call engraftment, others don't, and that's a very much a, a specific thing. So the idea would be that if you can, the more you understand about the ecosystem and you can work out what's deficient, rather than have to you know, use, um, do such a crude method, that you can actually identify, and maybe in the future you can pull off sets of probiotics that you can take in a tabular uh, form that could help you with your particular condition. Great. Um, so I guess a related question is, does a person's gut biome change during their lifetime? It certainly does. So in, this, in the early life, <coughs> it's uh, colonised from the mum, uh, and so it's quite different. It's, it's very heavily uh, guided by that process. And in fact, there's a really interesting, interesting study from researchers at UC Davis that shows there's a particular bifidobacterium uh, species called Infantis, uh, that is a heavy coloniser in the, in the infant gut. It's seeded from the mum, and then there's a couple of uh, particular uh, carbohydrates in the breast milk that promote the growth of those organisms. And their um, somewhat alarming finding is that that particular species is going extinct in Western cultures for various reasons. And so they're selling it now as a probiotic 
to try and seed the process. So they think that organism is important in the initial um, factoring of your immune system, so that your immune system knows how much to react or underreact or overreact. So that's an interesting study. Look that one up, Bifidobacterium infantis. Okay, so that's early life, and then after solid food comes on board, yeah, there's a pretty rapid movement towards the um, adult uh, community structure, which is basically firmicutes and bacteroides as your dominant uh, major groups. And that's pretty stable on most people across their lifetime until you get to about 75. And 75, all bets are off. So what happens is that um, lots of things happen. Usually there's a lot of medications, I guess, could be a modern effect. But um, you get breakdown of the uh, acid barrier in the stomach, so you start to see some oral microbiota heading down. And <clears throat> it goes off in all tangents. And so you saw the picture before of the everybody's uh, microbiome is unique. That was they're all mainly students that at mob. Um, that's the amount of diversity that you see in adults. Uh, and then when you get into the elderly phase, that can really go off script. Mm -hmm. So then there's a there's a good case to be made if you can work out what is the healthy status for um, you know well aging uh, elderly people that you might be able to help guide uh, others that are, that are going off script a bit too much. Right. I'm actually just going to invite you to, to come to the front of the stage there. Am so I you, leaning on your shoulder too much? No, no, it's just that my left ear is not my best side. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm trying to look to you so I can, you know, cheat to the audience. Marvellous. Um, next question is from Twitter, Jordan Pennells, who asks, if sequencing the microbiome involves mapping reads from multiple strains to references, and often these strains have not, previously, not been previously cultured, how is the reference from a non-isolated strain obtained? Reference from a non-isolated... Well, just the same way I just showed you with the, with the metagenomics. So that's a pretty detailed question. So... we will give one This is, one this is getting into there. the... So there is mounting evidence that some of the biology is going on at the subspecies level, so at, at the strain level. So when you... Um, with the current technology, when you get a mag, a metagenome assembled genome, what you're actually doing is you're pulling together reads... Um, from a population. So it's a bit like the difference between if I sequence my genome versus taking everybody in the room and taking all your DNA and coming up with a population level human genome, right? So that's, that's what we're looking at. So um, in terms of the... So it's, it's, a, it's a reference at the species level, but with the new technologies that are developing where essentially you're making the jigsaw pieces much larger than the current ones, um, you can get strain or subspecies level resolution. And the idea is that <coughs> the, the question actually hits on an important point, that if you, have, um, if you have an organism in your gut that's not represented in the reference database, then that read may go to a, the wrong organism or it may just not map. And so that's a technical issue, but you know, at the moment the database, the reference database is building at a huge rate of knots. And so I think we're gonna hit saturation across the core um, species in not too long a time, and so that's going to be reflected <coughs> in the percentage of reads that map from your sample. Mm -hmm. So um, in the, the database that's been built through the startup company, for instance, about 75 to 80 percent of the reads are now mapping because the database is building and the number of references are uh, increasing. Right. So another, um, I think not too tickle question, but any thoughts on why bacteria B. vulgatus um, and I, I can't remember what it is, and they've noted, you know, sick, hopefully that's right, but it's so prevalent in Australians, mice and guinea pigs, but not Europeans and Africans. Uh, so maybe a more general question, perhaps why is there a difference in different cultural microbiome? Well, there's definitely um, an effect from ethnicity, a small effect uh, from ethnicity, a small effect um, from cultural differences. Diet obviously has a large effect. Um, so one of the most well-known cases is a bacterium that you find in Japanese, in the gut microbiome of Japanese, that's been essentially um, co-opted from... It was growing on seaweed, which is part of their diet, and was co-opted into their gut microbiome so that they have an enhanced ability to break down the polymers in seaweed. And you only find them in, in Japanese. So you get a combination of geographic isolation, host genetic differences, and... Uh, that kind of fortuitous um, <coughs> trans, uh, you know, co-option of organisms from other habitats. 
Um, so, for instance, termites, for instance, I know I'm really getting off script here, um, there are some termites that live in cow dung, and they have picked up particular populations, not probably not from the cows, but from their herbivorous ancestors, and that have now become part of their gut microbiome. So it's that combination of lateral and vertical transfer of organisms. Mm. So I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know, that, that was me just um, bullshitting away because I don't actually know the specific answer to that <laughs> question. Uh, but I'm sure it's I, very I could... I think if you hadn't pointed that out, we yeah, would Yeah, okay. I could probably find somebody that would know that. Um, next question is from Tom. How do you go about determining what the actual function of these organisms are once you discover them? Um, so you do a process called um, annotation. So what you're looking for is you're looking for genes on that DNA. So the DNA, particularly microbial genomes, most of the DNA encodes protein, proteins. And so there's ways of identifying the start and stop of those proteins. And then you can classify what the protein uh, does, and so that's part of the annotation as well. And to be honest with you, <coughs> um, there's still a rather large chunk of genes, even within E. coli, that we don't actually know the function of. So we're getting a metabolic, what's called a metabolic reconstruction, and there's still a large chunk of genes that we don't know the function of. But then there are also a large a chunk of genes that we do know the function of. So we know the genes that um, make butyrate, we know the genes that break down mucin, we know a whole bunch, a whole range of functions that are relevant to the habitat. Did that answer the question? I think so, yes, okay. absolutely. And a final question from Twitter. Nicola asks, what helpful information can we learn from getting our gut microbiome tested? Hmm. Well, I would say that first and foremost, you'll get a species level, well, it depends, they didn't say how, because you can get that tested with 16S, so there are services that offer the 16S, and actually most of them will offer that. <coughs> and then there are emerging services that will offer the metagenome profile, so obviously I'm biased and say the metagenome profile will give you a lot more information. Um, so it'll give you a high resolution um, breakdown of the species in your gut, and as we, and then you, the, the, as you build the database and you do correlative analysis and you find out which species are present in people with hay fever or people that have anxiety, you can start to see, see these correlations Then you can identify and point that out to the consumer that they might have those organisms. You might even find out what um, B. vulgaris is doing, for instance. So uh, what I would say is that, and I hope that's what I communicated tonight, is that we're still in the, it's a very active research front where we're really just getting all the information together. Globally, this information is coming together and all those papers are not for nothing. And so I think five years from now, so at the moment, it's, um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to get the profile done, find out what's going on, a bit like getting your own genome sequence, find out, you know, what your, eth what your background is and all those sort of things. It's a little bit like that, so a little bit of the um, novelty factor, but I think in a few years from now, as the data builds up, we're going to know a lot more. So it's going to be a little bit like those Ancestry.coms or 23andMe that you keep coming back and you look at the new information as it builds up and say, oh, yeah, we now know that that organism that you have present is associated with this condition. So all that function is associated with this condition. Well, Phil, we'll lock you in for Brit Science December 2023 for your <laughs> next update. <laughs> And, uh, you know, somebody, somebody take note of that, you know, remind us in can 2023. Make, can you make we'll, it 2024? Yeah, go yeah. for you, no yeah, problem, thanks. 2024. Give you an extra, extra few yeah, months. Just, to, just give a bit of buffer. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Look, please join me in thanking our fantastic speaker tonight, Professor Phil Cuban Thank you very much. And please join us for some food and drink outside, and Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs>